would like to welcome everybody. We'll be starting our presentation just uh, two minutes after the hour to allow people to log in. Marcus, good to see you. That's what we, we have everyone muted. We have a complete power. We'll be starting the presentation right at 12.02. Want to give folks a chance to log on. You want to point out that we have workshops pretty much throughout the semester on Wednesdays. They start either at noon or at 11.30. The 11.30 workshops are for the hands-on live coding workshops. So we need a little bit of extra time for those. In addition to that, I uh, want to let you know that we do offer consults. So consults for undergraduates, consults for researchers. Uh, you'll be receiving an email later on this afternoon with information about how to sign up for, for consults. The idea is if you're thinking about a data science project, you wanna get started, but you're not too sure where to get started, or you think you might like to do a, a, a more engaging a, a project and, and maybe do it in collaboration with the DSI, uh, that's your first uh, point to get started. I'd like to introduce also our data science team. So we have Dr. Shara Bell, who is our senior data scientist, and we have uh, Iman Chowdhury, who just joined us as our data scientist. All right, I'd like to welcome you all. Very good. There's nothing quite like starting a presentation and having Zoom crash, but at least they did it in the most polite possible way. So I'd like to in, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome all, you all to our first workshop of the uh, of the semester. Uh, and today uh, we're going to be talking uh, about uh, data science uh, overview and and the state of the art. Uh, it, it probably goes without saying that. Uh, that this is highly opinionated, uh, it is not exhaustive, uh, but, uh, but I hope that it will give you a sense of what is out there right now, what's possible, and, uh, and, and what are the, some of the tools that are available to you. So uh, Dr. Bell, you can see my screen. Just wanna check in, excellent, very, very good. So we do have a series of uh, workshops going out throughout the uh, semester running, starting at noon or at 11.30 on Wednesdays. Um, so this is covering all the basics of working with uh, data science tools and uh, basics of machine learning. I would also like to point out that, uh, that we're also available for consultations. So undergraduates can sign up for this, researchers can sign up for this, and you can either visit us at the data science at Vanderbilt or you can uh, wait for a link, which you'll have in your email a little bit later on uh, this afternoon. I'd also like to let you all know we do have a master's in data science, 
uh, deadline is actually today for first round consideration. I'm sorry, not today. It's this Friday. Pardon me. Can anybody panic? Um, it's this Friday for first round uh, consideration, the two-year program, full-time program. So today we're going to be talking about uh, the overview of, of data science. Um, I'd like to, to start uh, first by, by talking about uh, giving some context uh, for, for data science, in particular machine learning versus deep learning. Then we're going to be talking about the state of the art of, of research. This is going to be incomplete. It's going to be opinionated. But these are the things that, at least personally, I think are most important right now. And this seems to be borne out by the uh, uh, amount of activity and research going on in these particular areas. Then we're going to be talking about state of the art in usability. Uh, because all these advances only matter if we can actually use them to solve problems. I'm going to talk uh, about the societal impact of some of these advances, which actually turn out to be really quite important and, and possibly devastating unless we, we pay attention now. Uh, and then I'm going to end with getting started. So, the field of, of what's been called AI has been around for a long, long time. You know, all the way back in the 1950s, uh, computer scientists and researchers were, were talking about how to build general problem solvers. In the 60s and 70s, uh, in the, it, first the idea of a perceptron, can we actually model part of, at least just one neuron of the human brain, and can we do a little bit better than that? Uh, then a little bit later, uh, expert systems. Can we build systems that encode all the knowledge of an expert? Now, you can notice that these are not actually continuing. These sort of stopped. Uh, even neural nets that, that had a, a real heyday in the, in the 1980s uh, ended. There was what's commonly called the, the, the winter, the, the uh, 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 AI winter, where for a while, just people believed it was insurmountable. Expert systems were, were too uh, brittle. Um, Neural nets were too difficult to train. They, they couldn't handle sufficiently complex problems. But then late 1990s and 2000s, machine learning started to come to the fore. Uh, you can think of machine learning. Some of it is statistical models. Some of it is outside of statistical models. But the idea here is that uh, you have these algorithms that could take structured data that's prepared, and it could actually build decision trees uh, based on this information. It could build predictive models. It could actually use this uh, to, uh, uh, to build a, a useful uh, uh, solutions uh, that seem to generalize well. They could use to solve multiple types of problems. Um, only sort of downside is that the data does need to be prepared. It needs to be uh, uh, all the features that you think are important need to be identified and included in the data. Then we had a renaissance uh, in 2010 and after in deep learning. Uh, uh, and the interesting thing about uh, deep learning is that it is not necessary is not necessary uh, for you to uh, create all the features. Deep learning has an even greater ability to take raw data and then to answer questions directly, building its own features, learning directly off of the data. So let's go ahead and take a look at, uh, at machine learning versus deep learning. So machine learning, uh, you have a feature waiting. And that's essentially what it's doing. It's taking all the features that you've created, waits the features. In deep learning, you have representation learning. So it actually learns the features and learns the complex relationships between those features in order to, to make uh, a predictions or to, to do useful things. Machine learning, the features have to be engineered by, by data scientists. It's a, it's a lot of work. Deep learning, the features are actually learned from the data. Um, the flip side of this is that usually with machine learning, you can get by with less data. Whereas in deep learning, because it's having to learn the features and also learn all the relationships, it must have massive amounts of data in order to, to, to learn. Machine learning can be more transparent. You can actually see what features were most important, and uh, it's easy to reverse engineer what was going on. Deep learning, it's less transparent. To get that same type of understanding of what's going on requires a, a deep amount of mathematics and statistics and, uh, and engineering. Machine learning is 
largely turnkey for training. Uh, once you, uh, doesn't get you the best model necessarily, but you can get to at least that first step model uh, using default parameters or using some software to help you to tune a little bit. You can get in the ballpark without, without having to, to, to spend uh, weeks and months. Deep learning, on the other hand, it's much more involved for, for training. Um, part of it is art, part of it is science. It takes a long time to try to, to, to build these models. And so not nearly as easy. Machine learning, uh, less expertise is, is needed. You need to understand what's going and to, to truly take advantage. You do have to have a, a the understanding of, of math and, and statistics. But in deep learning, uh, more expertise is, is needed specifically for, for deep learning. So uh, is it worth the effort? Well, yeah, the special capabilities are the feature learning. Uh, it also uh, has an interesting capability uh, to, uh, to do transfer learning. So somebody else could train a network for you and you could benefit from transfer learning. It's, it's learned the basics of the task and you can actually do some fine tuning so it can do your particular task. And that actually turns out to be a way around a good number of these problems. Another thing which is interesting is self-supervised learning. Remember I mentioned that with uh, deep learning you have to have massive amounts of data. Well, having massive amounts of labeled data is very difficult, but using an approach called self-supervised learning uh, you don't have to have all labeled data in order to get a usefully trained uh, network. So let's take these one at a time a little bit. Let's talk about transfer and learning just a little bit. The idea here is that there exists a, a network that somebody else has trained for you. They've, they, they've spent the money, they've spent the compute uh, to actually train up a, a large network for you. Here's, here's a, a uh, 34 layer ResNet. And what it offers the, us the ability to do is to uh, have the network forget uh, to untrain the last few layers of the network and then put it to a different task. So it might have been trained on one task. You can actually then point this pre trained model at a different task. And with very few or far fewer uh, training examples, now you can solve problems that the original network wasn't necessarily designed to do. So that means it requires less expertise, less time. Uh, the models tend to be far more robust. Now, what about self-supervised learning? Well, self-supervised learning is training on incidental tasks. And so the deep learning network can actually learn about uh, a particular area without necessarily having to have labeled data. So Self-supervision in, in uh, a training on, on texts might look like uh, you, you put a network, uh, uh, you ask a, a network to guess the next letter in a sentence or in a corpus. And since that next letter is in the corpus, you actually know what the answer is. So all that has to do is try to guess what that next letter is or guess what the next word is. Uh, and then you have essentially all this labeled data. And because of transfer learning, you can then take that pre-trained network and apply it to lots of different areas. You can do this with images as well. So for example, uh, you could give uh, a network um, puzzle pieces, if you will. So these would be uh, an image that is chopped up or, or put in a different order. And the task given to the network is learn how to put this together. So you know what the image looks like once it's put together. The network spends time, learns how to put it together, and by that way, learns about image segmentation, learns about the content of the images, and produces something which is useful for later work. Same thing with uh, learning on, on uh, images uh, in, in sequence. Um, take them out of sequence, you have the network learn how to put them in order, and then the network is uh, learns and can be used for other applications. So, uh, this solves a, a good number of, of the problems that we have with, uh, with networks. Oh, and one moment. Because the other thing which is good is when fire alarms go off in the middle of a Zoom. 
Let's go and just take a two minute break and I'll be right back. There we go. So now we have the overview of this machine learning and deep learning. So what's been happening? Well, it turns out that most of what's been happening has been happening in the deep learning. Um, so uh, in, in deep learning, there's been, there are thousands, tens of thousands of articles published uh, each year on deep learning. So it's, it's an area of intense work and intense uh, development. So today we're gonna to be talking about is state of the art research, just a few items of state of the art research, some of which is quite surprising. The next thing we're gonna talk about is state of the art and usability, and then we're gonna be ending with the social impact and the next steps. So state of the art research, uh, two big advances for this year are uh, the development of AlphaFold and uh, AlphaFold, a long-standing problem, if not completely solved, was moved much further forward. And this is the problem of protein folding. So using uh, deep learning techniques, uh, it's now possible to predict what the final shape of proteins will be uh, without using a, a lot of hints. So this is a huge problem of, of simulation and learning from the structure of the protein and, and where it will actually end up folding. It's been a long-standing problem, and now it has, uh, uh, using deep learning, has certainly been moved forward, so uh, it, it's possible to uh, actually begin to investigate without having to do, uh, without having to do uh, uh, wet lab uh, experiments. Uh, the other advancement, and this was earlier in the year, is in GPT-3. When we had this conversation last year, we talked about GPT-2. And how amazing GPT-2 was because it had, it was able to, to generate text, uh, it was able to do self-supervised, it was trained on self-supervised learning on an enormous, con enormous uh, uh, corpus of text, and it had uh, over a billion parameters, the largest, largest uh, model uh, ever produced at the time. Well, at the beginning of this year, uh, we had GPT-3, which now has 175 billion parameters and has been trained on an even a larger corpus of text. And this is work by uh, OpenAI. Uh, so they've created and have applied uh, GPT-3 to a number of different areas. The interesting thing about this is that because it was trained on this enormous amount of text and learned all of these representations, remember deep learning, it learns its own representations. It learned very complex representations. So learned its own language model, learned concepts, uh, and to the point where what they found was that these models uh, could be uh, few shot learners. So remember before I mentioned that with transfer learning, it took far less data for you to train up the model to be useful. It actually turns out with uh, GPT-3, uh, it's, it's a few shot learner or a no shot learner. So you can give it text that has never seen before, you can ask it to classify, and by simply giving it the labels of the categories that you wish it to find, in many instances, it can do it without any training. How does it do that? Well, it understands the labels that you've given to the categories. So that means with very little training, as in just a few examples, or with no training, the model has the capability to, uh, to generalize and to answer questions, give it text, do summarization, answer questions. Uh, all of those things are possible without necessarily having to do uh, uh, additional uh, training. So, exactly can they do? Well, they can do next sentence prediction. They can actually continue to write uh, even full stories for you. You saw that with GPT-2. Now it does an even better job. It can do question answering. It can do reading comprehension, sentiment analysis, paraphrasing. Uh, all those things are, are, are possible with this uh, huge, largest ever model. Oh, 
I mentioned largest ever? Not anymore. Actually, because uh, just earlier this year, this year, January 11th, an article was published uh, on switch transformers. And this is by Google. So with switch transformers, uh, now you have an even larger. So now we have 1.6 billion, uh, I'm sorry, I was off, 1.6 trillion parameters in this model trained on an even larger corpus of text, which is capable of even uh, uh, better uh, uh, generalization. So uh, of course, we're getting quite large here. Um, this cannot be run, even GPT-3 cannot be run on, on regular hardware without, uh, well, it just can't be run. With switch transformers, the, the interesting thing here is that the model was trained in a very, and, and has a very sparse representation and then it can be brought down and made dense and actually still capturing a good bit of the performance that it had uh, previously. So it starts out large, learns, and then can be condensed further down. And so it's possible for it to, uh, uh, to still perform nearly as well as the full uh, model. So the other thing which is interesting about these models is, um, even though GPT-3 and the switch transformers, their original use was in natural language processing, the summarization and, and question answering. Now they've been applied to many other fields. So for example, if you think and step away from text just a little bit where the task is you're learning uh, uh, context. So you have a word which is in context. The word is simply a symbol. Uh, transform models have the ability to attend to different parts of the sentence or even further away. And through this context, begin to build up a representation of all the possible, mean possible meanings of this word and what the meaning of this word given the surrounding context. Well, that can be true for anything. It doesn't have to be just with words. It could be with any signal that's changing over time. So, so for example, uh, earthquake transformer. So you can uh, apply these models uh, to, uh, uh, to, to look at signals for uh, earthquakes. You can uh, make predictions about where people are gonna be walking in a crowd because you have the history of where they walked before. You can use visual transformers. So rather than doing text or, or any signal over time, you can simply take an image, break it down into a vector, treat it like a long list, and have it do transformer tasks on the images. It learns about the images, even though it's learning them uh, just as a, as a linear trend, as, as a linear uh, uh, set of symbols. You can do recommendation engines off of this. Uh, transformers can learn chess. Uh, they can do transformer uh, based acoustic modeling. So they can do hybrid speech recognition. Um, all of these things are possible. Uh, one of the most fascinating areas too is applying this now also to biological problems. If you think of DNA, for example, again, you have symbols over time. The limiting factor for this though, especially in the case of, of applying this to the problem of, of, uh, of DNA and, and, uh, and also protein research has been the limited attention. It turns out that this trick of picking a particular signal, a, a symbol and learning its context that learning that contest is expensive. And so there's a limited attention span around uh, where it learns. So uh, down here on the Big Bird Transformer, their big uh, contribution has been to extend that attention by using simple compression. Well, I say simple, it was an elegant application of it. So what this now opens the door for next is the application of these transformer models the areas where you need to have very, very long attention span. You're not going to get any useful information from analyzing DNA uh, if all you get uh, uh, is just the first few symbols around. You need to be able to go, uh, you know, the, perhaps the entire length. So it's a new area which is now being opened up by these by this expanding attention uh, span uh, of these models. Another interesting application here is. Uh, the jumping from the problem of understanding natural language processing to actually beginning with speech. So again, if you consider speech 
includes all of the symbols that we have that we normally would try to transcribe into, into words and then do an analysis of the words. New application of transformers uh, and, and to this type of uh, self-supervised approach is to go directly from the wave file to the conceptual representation. So with no translation in the middle. And it turns out even this is possible. Uh, again, with these new types of, of transformer models uh, and this longer attention span. So taking a wave file and then directly doing an analysis of it so you can figure out the concepts that are being discussed, but you don't even take that intermediate step to try to translate it to text first. Uh, to me, pretty remarkable. So all of this is so, so cool. Um, but you know the, the, the fact is that uh, None of this is really useful, uh, or the, 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 the usefulness of this is limited because of usability issues. These are immense models. It takes city level power. So powering a, a mid-sized city for, for days or weeks to actually power all the computers to train these models in the first place. It costs millions of dollars of compute to train these models uh, in, in the first place. Uh, inferencing can be expensive as well. So that's one problem to, to us, data scientists and others being able to use these models. Two, there's a prolif proliferation of models. I, I mentioned that there are tens of thousands of articles published each year in deep learning. Almost all of these publications involve the creation of yet another model. So how are you supposed to know what's out there, what the models are capable of and, and what we might be able to use in, in our own work? And, and finally, a lot of this code is very dense and is customized. It might be written for uh, one framework versus another framework. Um, how are we supposed to actually use this way to learn so many different programming styles to be able to apply this? Well, this is where we get into the state of the art in usability. So over the last few years, there's been a lot of effort uh, put into making simpler models that have nearly the same capability of these larger models. This is called efficient nets. The idea, um, much like that uh, was, was done in the switch transformer by Google, taking these large models, coming up with smaller and smaller representations that require less uh, compute to do the fine tuning, if fine tuning is required. They can inference faster. You can run them on samples much faster than, than before. And also, these can finally be run on consumer hardware. So you have a discrete graphic card in your laptop or in a server. And you can actually begin to run these very useful models because these are the smaller versions. They're not gonna be the same uh, accuracy as the full-blown models, but they're very close. So that's one part of uh, the state of the art in, in usability. But what about the problem of having all these different models, uh, these thousands of different models that are available? Well, even there, there's been some really nice uh, movement. And probably the best example that I can think of this is Hugging Face. So Hugging Face is uh, uh, started out as, uh, as a group that was trying to, to, to collect different transformer models. Uh, and then they moved into actually creating versions of models that were both in the two main uh, deep learning frameworks, uh, TensorFlow and, and PyTorch. And then over the last year, They've put a lot of effort into sharing these models out, making it easy for people to contribute models and making it much more accessible for people to come in and to see what uh, is available in these transformer models. So now it's possible to go in and search a model for content area. So here's a model which is specially trained on uh, or fine tuned on uh, legal documents. So the original model was called BERT, one of these very expensive models to train uh, that, that took a lot of power and a lot of compute, a lot of money and time to train, but now it's been fine tuned on legal documents. And uh, what Hugging Face has done is create a hub where you can search and then find this, this particular model. And the other fascinating and, and huge contribution they've made, they've also made a hosted inference API. So you have the information about the model, what's, how to use it, information about it, the code, the data set it was trained on, everything, 
All that information is something called a model card. Second, information on so you can actually try it out. So this hosted inference API. So here's an example. Uh, here's just a sample. You can type in whatever you want to here. Uh, the task here is going to be a fill mask, meaning we're going to take a word out. We're going to put a little mask on top. We're going to ask for it to guess what the word should be. Here's, here's the sample one that I have ready to go here. The applicant submitted that her husband was subjected to treatment amounting to mask whilst in custody of police. So if we compute this, and it computes in real time up on the hugging face for us, the best guess that it has is torture. So you can put questions, you can put, uh, you can test out these models before you actually, uh, you can test them out before you download and put effort into trying to apply them uh, to your particular area. They also have data sets available here for you to train your own models. And Remember that extremely cool model that I was just mentioning before with the wave files and going directly to the conceptual representation directly from the speech file. Even that is available now on, on Hugging Face uh, as of just um, even two days ago. So now wave two vec two is available on Hugging Face. So you can actually upload a wave file with speech and have it come up with the concepts that it identifies that are mentioned uh, in, that, in that speech. So remarkable power and available, uh, you can simply browse to it uh, and get to it. So and we'll be sharing all of these links, by the way, uh, in an email uh, later this afternoon. So that solved a couple of problems. We have efficient nets to solve the problem of these huge models. We have, we have uh, the excellent, uh, 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 model hub from uh, Hugging Face. But what about the, the, the problem where we want to create our own models or we want to do sort of low level work on models? Still, all these models are written in, in so many different ways. Uh, how do we go about building our own? Well, another nice advancement over the past year was the release of Fast.ai version two. Fast.ai is built on top of PyTorch. It offers a uh, high level interface a mid-level uh, interface, and a, uh, a low-level uh, interface. So uh, it's a layered API for deep learning, which means if all that you want to do is to take a particular hugging face model and do some additional fine-tuning on it, right? there are interfaces to grow the hugging face model, bring it in, do some modification, and come up with a, a slightly new version. Let's say that you actually want to go deeper. You actually want to go down and you want to change some of the layers of the network. Also possible with those middle level APIs. But let's say you even want to go deeper and you want to change some fundamental aspects of the architecture and see what that looks like. That also is possible with a low level API. So the big breakthrough here is creating this layered API. So you're not locked in to the high level nor do you always have to deal with just the low level, you can approach at the appropriate level for you. Starting out, start with high level, see how well you can do, go down to a lower level of API if you need to, to make some adjustments or do your own research, all the way down to the uh, lowest level. So we, we should be in great shape. We have all these models. Uh, we, we have this uh, uh, tremendous effort that's been put into creating these large language models, except let's pause for a moment and let's think about the corpus with which these large language, model, language models have been built. Uh, models have been built on text that appears on the internet and in other areas. And these large language models are developing representations of the concepts that it's fine, that, that it's finding there. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, the models are amplifying those biases that are encoded in this data. So if you're crawling data, if you're getting data from communities of conversation where there is pervasive gender or uh, religious or uh, uh, racial bias, 
those concepts will actually be deeply encoded in this new large language uh, deep learning model. This is certainly uh, on the, the, the radar of, of researchers. There's been a great deal of work, there's been 23,000 articles just since 2020 on bias in AI. But the fact is with the creation of these new models, which are now easier than ever for us to apply in, in work, what we're finding is that the models are already being distributed and being used in work. And the biases that are learned or encoded in these are also being applied as well. So this is very much a time to, to raise the alarm, raise the understanding of how these models work and how bias can work into the models. Uh, because it could be that the model that you're pulling off of the shelf to, certain, to solve certain problems already has these biases that are uh, deeply uh, encoded. I'd, I'd like to say that this is state of the art for work that's been done uh, this year, but this is in, in a real sense work yet to be done. So that's, uh, that is on us to do what we can. Uh, we're, we're not there, we're not doing a great job yet. Uh, we've had the case of Dr. Tim Nutgebru uh, from, uh, from who was previously with Google who was trying to raise these issues and who is no longer with, uh, with Google, which uh, raises concerns about uh, the commitment of, uh, of all companies developing these large models uh, to uncovering and, uh, and discussing uh, the bias, which is deeply encoded in these models. So fairness and bias research, uh, what, what I personally would love to see is much like we have these model hubs uh, for testing out models, we also have model hubs, which can help you test out uh, your models for, uh, for evident bias and to make that something which is available to, to everyone. We'll likely be having a workshop on that uh, uh, later on, uh, if not this semester, then over the summer. We'll let you know about it when we do. Uh, Dr. Bell already has, has given a, a great presentation on this, so we hope to uh, be able to offer that as well. So where are we now? Okay. Transformers have come to the fore. Transformers are being developed and, and applied to areas well outside of natural language processing. Uh, it really is an exciting time. And part of it is, is exciting because now we have the ability to use some of these models ourselves uh, in our own work. So in order for us to, to be able to do this, however, uh, you do need to have, there's a price of entry. So you don't get this exactly for free. Uh, there's some coding involved. So if you are interested in deep learning and you're not yet a coder, uh, Python is gonna be the, the, the price of entry. If you know Python, but you haven't worked with these models before, the, the news is good. Uh, Fast.ai and other frameworks make it much easier for you to get in. So what's missing from this picture? You, your area of research, your area of interest. These models are ready to be applied. Uh, it's going to be exciting to see what you all do uh, with these models. And to that end, I'd like to uh, uh, close out by uh, offering the following. Uh, if you have an idea for a data science project, but you don't know where to start, uh, know that we offer data science consultations. So if you want to talk more in depth about how you might be able to use these models for your research, uh, then you know, you can visit us at uh, Data Science and uh, uh, Vanderbilt uh, webpage, uh, or you can actually even just wait for an email a little bit later on today. You'll be getting a link about how to uh, how to connect with us. Also, we'll mention that we do have the master's in, in data science. Uh, uh, first round uh, is uh, is closing this uh, this Friday uh, for applications. And of course, we have our workshops. So. The intent of these workshops is to get you ready to use these types of uh, these models and to do this type of work. You're going to have them every week this, uh, uh, this semester. So please uh, take some time, look over the offerings that we have, and uh, we welcome you to our upcoming workshops. Excellent. I'd like to open the, uh, the floor now for any questions that might, you might have. Uh, you are welcome to uh, unmute yourself uh, or uh, you can also put uh, uh, into chat. Let me give you the ability, the ability to unmute yourself now. 
and be happy to take any questions that you might have. Hello, Jesse. This is Peter Lewis. Uh, excellent uh, introductory presentation. Um, thank you very much. Awesome. Uh, I have a deep interest in computer vision and like to know what is the state of the art research in terms of computer vision with respects to um, transformers and diffusion algorithms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really an interesting uh, idea, first of all. When, when they first were, were announced, I was, I was really quite impressed. Uh, the, the challenge with transformers being applied to, to images right now, and just make this clear, again, transformers learn about the meaning of symbols in context. And so it looks for the surrounding area for the context to actually get at, at what the, the meaning of the symbol is. So interesting application, You you much like you do with convolution, neural nets, you, you spread out the image as just a very, very long vector of the pixel values. But now what it's doing, instead of doing these convolutions and sort of learning things in the neighborhood, it's learning the context of what is close to this particular pixel. Challenge to this point has been, you have a limit to the number of symbols to how far out you can go. Uh, so about 512 is about how far out you can go. And it gets very expensive uh, and very difficult to do. But with new work, in expanding the, uh, the attention span of this, uh, you're, you're gonna see more and more improvement in what's possible. Already, even with the current approaches, you get performance that is close to uh, the state of the art with your more traditional pre-trained networks with, uh, and convolutional neural nets. Uh, close to, but not uh, above in most cases. And there's the challenge that, that these transformer models, why, while more easily trainable in parallel than the old style uh, long short-term memory and recurrent neural net, you know, it's more parallelizable. It doesn't yet compare to CNNs and the more traditional models. Uh, so it still requires more compute. It's not as easy to, to parallelize, but that too is, is also making some, uh, uh, some headway. So um, I, I, I'm looking forward to see what comes forward next. They're still a bit more expensive uh, and there are fewer pre-trained models. You know, you have, you have many pre-trained models of the CNN type to do image analysis. But uh, uh, I, I'm looking forward to this year in particular to seeing now with these uh, transformer models with larger attention spans, how well they will do and stack up against the, the more traditional uh, CNN models. Hope that answers your question. Uh, so Jesse, so uh, did you provide more technique workshop in the future, like you will do some like code example step by step and uh, yeah, something like absolutely. that. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Lee. Yes, absolutely we will. But the workshops that we have in the early part of the semester are more around, uh, you know, Git and GitHub. Then in the middle of the semester, we, we begin to touch on, um, on machine learning and deep learning uh, uh, Kind of at the high level that I was mentioning before, where we reuse we're using the, the high level APIs, but then over those over the summer in, in the May master, uh, and we'll be sending out information about this. We are going to do an intensive Python for deep learning a workshop. So it'll be a week long. It'll be every day, uh, but the idea will idea will be to get you to the point where you can use these models, sort of off the shelf, with some fine tuning. Uh, to allow you to apply them to, to your particular area. Uh, and then we do have uh, a good recommendations about how you can go even deeper uh, than that to, to learn about uh, some of the fundamentals of, of deep learning from a more coding uh, perspective. And of course, we have our master's program in our, in our classes there too. Thanks for the question. Do you mean that is uh, intensive another program? It's, uh, this is free, actually. And it's over, it's after the classes end. Um, so it's the middle of May, and, uh, and it's all about uh, coding for deep learning uh, for uh, uh, using uh, these frameworks. So using, in particular, fast.ai in Hugging Face. And all the students can attend. Yeah, there will be an application process. There's going to be some pre-work that will be necessary for it. Because it's so intensive and it requires a lot of work, we, uh, we'd love to be able to open up to everybody, but we will put the information out there. 
and uh, and we'll see how how much room we can make uh, for folks. Okay, thank you. Other questions. One question, Reza from Memphis. Yes. Uh, is there any? Because uh, pretty much, I just finished the uh, master in epidemiology. I am very familiar with the SAS coding, R coding. You know, I'm pretty much. I know a lot. Where West about you know logistic regression. Yes. So, uh, I mean, you mentioned, I guess, a bunch of, uh, I guess, you know, uh, 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 I guess, besides re linear regression. So, is there any preference besides linear regression when you do your study? Yeah, so let me go ahead and share my uh, screen again. And uh, I'll mention something here. So uh, you see that, that we do indeed mention oh, you linear clear. regression right here. Um, so we mentioned right, linear, yeah. oh, go ahead. Go ahead. So we mentioned linear regression here, uh, depending on whether you're talking to a statistician or to a uh, uh, machine or a computer scientist, they will either call this uh, statistical learning or machine learning. And that is not a fight I'm willing to get into the middle of. But, uh, but it does answer the same types of questions, can answer the same, same types of questions that you can get at with other types of machine learning. The difference here is, as you know, with logistic regression is that, uh, or with other types of regression, you have to say exactly what the features are. So you have to design those and put those in. In machine learning, the sort of additional step that we have is we have regularized uh, regression, especially regularized logistic regression. So you can start with a large number of features and it will help hone down to the ones that are most important. Um, you used to, people used to believe that they could do this in, in with a statistical approach using you know, a stepwise until we realized it is a terrible, terrible idea. Penalized regression is actually a way to do that in a meaningful way. So what's different is the types of questions that you can answer. In a purely statistical approach, then you can ask, infer ask and answer inferential questions. In a machine learning approach, you're more interested in whether these things generalize, you're interested in prediction. Uh, and you may figure out which features are more, more important than others. Uh, in deep learning, it's different yet again, because now you're, you're interested in not necessarily specifying what all the features are, you're saying learn, you know, figure out what the relationships are. I'm really only interested in these other types of tasks, these other types of, you know, prediction tasks or summarization or sentence production, those types of things. So you're really doing two different types of things, even though the tech underneath for, for logistic regression is the same for in uh, statistical learning or statistics and machine learning. Gotcha. All right. Other questions? Uh, another question I have. Uh, I think you mentioned you're going to share your PowerPoint with us, correct? Yes. OK, OK, thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much. And, and actually, in, in true form, what we'll be doing, I, I still need to do to move a few things over. We'll be sharing the repo uh, that has all of this, so you'll be able to get uh, to that within the repository. OK, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know how to get to the repository, come to our, one of our workshops, and you'll learn how to. Well, I mean, I just, uh, I got an email from Vanderbilt. I guess you guys have a workshop and all I mean, so mm -hmm. I'm trying to, I guess I have basic understanding about this, the subject, you know, right now I'm just in the middle of enough, uh, looking desperately for a job, you know what I mean? <laughs> As Understood. a data scientist or epidemiologist, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So unfortunately it hasn't happened, haven't had a good luck so far. <laughs> Understandable. Yeah. It will come. Other questions? Thanks so much. Absolutely. Jesse? Yes. Yeah, Peter again. Uh, you mentioned uh, n shot learning uh, slash few shot learning. Uh, few shot learning, excuse me. Yes. Uh, can you explain the difference between that and one class learning? Um, well, let me characterize. <clears throat> what I can do is characterize that, that no shot or, or a, a few shot learning. Uh, the idea is that with these. Uh, previously, to do transfer learning, you would take a pre-trained network. Let's take something like ResNet, ResNet 34. Uh, it's pre-trained on all of these uh, images. And because it's pre-trained, all you have to do is to do some fine tuning on the last few layers and change the categorization text. So if I want to categorize cat versus dog, 
then it requires just maybe a few dozen exemplars and then I'm good. So, but a few dozen. Um, in what's new uh, about these very large language models is that uh, you either can get away with very, very few examples, like on, on like four, five, where you say, here's some examples of, of, uh, of a document, you know, of a, of a medical report which indicates a particular type of cancer. Here's another medical report which indica indicates a different kind of cancer. Here, just four of each. And the models actually can do pretty well with that. What's amazing is with the no-shot learning, is that if you simply give the labels to the categories, they can also perform decently well, um, especially if you have like a sentence describing what the categories are, uh, because then what it, it uh, because it, it has the, the good representations for all the text that goes with the label for that category, it doesn't need examples. It can get as close, uh, it, it can get fairly close to answering correctly even without having uh, benefit of, of seeing training examples. And how is that different from one class learning? Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm unsure because I'm, I'm, I, I have to think about, I'm, I'm coming up short on one class learning right now. I'm just, I'm just, I, I, I can't, uh, uh, I understand that one class learning is like one of the tasks is for for one class learning tasks excuse me is um anomaly detection oh right okay yes <laughs> yeah um so in that in that kind of a, a an approach um that's right so you're so you're looking for for elements that are uh that, that are different from and so it says one versus all uh, as you mentioned, the outlier detection. Um, so, so there, it's not based necessarily on a representation of the categories. You're simply looking for uniqueness or difference from. Um, whereas what's happening in with, this, with these few shot learning is these are meaningful categories um, where you might have falling in one or the other, or even in some cases where you have two categories and then you have other. And it's still able to sort of figure out and, and to classify these based on the content of the labeling for the category itself, rather than figuring out things that are different from. Um, so uh, I, I hope that uh, you reach out to me afterwards and I'll, and I'll be happy to sort of dive into a little bit more. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? I have one. Yes. Um, this, I'm total novice with this. Um, it sounds to me like what this is doing is a, an extremely sophisticated pattern recognition, mm -hmm. um, then being mapped to, uh, uh, to some sort of, um, vector space, um, of, of, um, categories and that your, your claim about the appropriateness of the categories may have to do with what the basis of that big vector space uh -huh. is. Is this by is, is this a wrong way to look at it? And if it's not a wrong way to look at it, can you offer any example of how this has been or is being applied in the physical sciences? Hmm. Uh, so I don't think that's, I, I think that's a, a, a good way uh, of thinking about it. The wording is, is a little bit different. In deep learning, uh, we often talk about encoding uh, and embeddings, but the embedding very much exists as a, you know, high dimensional vector in a very high dimensional space. And the idea very much is that this is a meaningful space. It's a semantic space. And so when you have, you know, something which is close to, in this embedding space, you have, you have concepts that are close to, uh, then that means that they're related in some way. And what transformers do is to give the, the multiple meanings based on the context of where this particular word uh, uh, appeared. It's, it's been a problem with embeddings for, for a while that a word may have many different meanings. And so where does it exist in the space? And the answer is if you take the context of the words around or the context of the image around, now you can place it in multiple places in the space and it depends on the context. And that's where the idea of attention comes in 
paying attention. But other than that, yes, it is all vectors. It is all sitting in, in a very large space, um, but just referred to as, as embeddings. Um, so uh, the, the space itself turns out to be really quite interesting. So when you train on a large corpus, you find that uh, that embedding space includes some really interesting uh, representations. Um, one of their early applications of GPT-2, one of the, the earlier models on this was to test it out to see how well it could do on the eighth grade science exam for, uh, uh, for the New York regions. You know, could it pass you know, the, that, that science exam? Did it, did it learn enough of the representations to be able to, to you know, relate ice with water and temperature? And the answer is yes, it actually, it didn't do a great score, but it passed, you know, with sentence completion and, uh, and uh, fill in the blank and, uh, and, and the uh, multiple choice. So it's very much capturing the, 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 the meaning there. So application to the, to, to the physical sciences, I'm very excited to see what applications there, there are. Anytime that you have the problems that, that you were kind of de describing there, this is a good possible application of this type of ability to pick out structure uh, and meaning uh, from these, you know, very complex high dimensional spaces. And keep in mind that these deep learning models learn the relationships. Uh, it's, it's learning the representations, but it's also learning the relationships between these. And so if you have physical laws or properties that are, that, that govern, you know, what's happening, uh, given either enough labeled data or a way of coming up with this self-supervised learning where you're learning on incidental uh, information, it can learn those relationships and those, and those structures. Something else that, that I didn't talk about, but that I, I think is, is exciting too, is to have science-informed deep learning models. Uh, deep learning models have to search a huge parameter space, 1.6 trillion parameters. I mean, I, I, I shudder to think at how much energy was used to train this thing. But if you have a more defined space, of, of work that you're interested in, you might have some analytical solutions, which you can use as sort of the starting point. So rather than saying search anywhere, you can say search in these particular directions as governed by this equation that I have, which is a good representation of what's happening. Those models can then learn much faster and with uh, less training data as well, even if you're just training them from the ground up. Jesse, is embedding space the same thing as the hidden layer, intermediate layer, or manifold? It, it arises from. Uh, so the embedding space usually means that there is some sort of semantic embedding. Uh, but that's, that's I, I love that you brought up the manifold as well. If you, if you don't want to invest you know, that kind of meaning, meaning there, then you can refer to it as, as a high-dimensional manifold, absolutely. It arises from those hidden layers. It, it is a result of the weights between the nodes and the hidden layers. That's exactly where it comes from. Um, but unfortunately, it's not as simple as just looking and taking a snapshot of the weights at a particular time uh, to, to understand what's, what's going on with them. Other questions? All right, then let me go ahead and invite you again to join us for our other workshops. Uh, we'll be happy to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, we'll be emailing you some information about, about this presentation, about other presentations coming up. You can uh, visit us simply by searching for data science at uh, vanderbilt.edu. You can find our webpage and sign up for additional workshops. I'd like to thank everybody for attending today. Real pleasure, terrific questions. Look forward and hope to see you uh, at presentations later on in the semester.